climate change demands that we think about the state. Climate change, because of its extreme weather and the emergencies that those create, calls forth state action. And the question is whether the state will return as a repressive mechanism or whether the state will expand its role in a more positive way by embracing the problems of mitigating the causes of climate change, which is to say getting off of fossil fuels and building out a renewable energy sector, and in terms of adaptation, which is to say adapting to the changes that climate change uh, brings, both physical changes like rising sea levels and also the social upheavals that go along with that, massive migration, for example. So, so adaptation has both a, a social and a physical side to it. And the, the state is called forth because climate change creates these emergencies. And it's important, I think, to realize that government is, uh, in the U.S., government is, is usually described as no good, part of the problem, but actually government is really essential to the solution of both adaptation and mitigation. In terms of mitigation, getting off of fossil fuels, the important thing to realize is that we have the technologies we need. We, it's not like we haven't invented uh, electric vehicles, commercial scale, solar and wind, we have uh, electrical grids. We also have the money, particularly in the United States, there's more uninvested money that corporations are sitting on than at any time since the Federal Reserve has kept these records. This is money that firms retain for investment, not money that is given out to stockholders or bonuses to managers. So that firms have this uninvested capital. There's also the, the role of the public sector. The public sector in the U.S. is actually quite large. It's about 38% of the economy. The government consumes enormous amounts of energy. The federal government has a fleet of 100, uh, 450,000 office buildings, many of which are very wasteful. These could be retrofitted, but these offices all consume power. The federal government has uh, vehicle fleets. The state governments have vehicle fleets. And so there's the, the money that is part of state consumption, state uh, investment. We also actually, believe it or not, have the laws. We have, in the United States, some of the most powerful environmental laws in the world. The problem is we just don't implement them. And we, unfortunately, in the first years of the Obama administration, we wasted a lot of time pursuing new comprehensive climate legislation, which didn't happen, and in many cases, given the versions of legislation that were proposed, would have been worse than the current laws if they had been passed. But the, the key law that's important in the United States is from 1970, and it's called the Clean Air Act. And it, that law says that smokestack emissions that, sci, that science finds to be harmful to human health have to be regulated. And there was a lawsuit that was launched in 1996 that was finally settled by the Supreme Court in 2007. It was called Massachusetts versus EPA, which stands for the Environmental Protection Agency. And this suit, which was launched by Massachusetts, several other states, and some large green groups, said that the federal government should regulate greenhouse gas emissions because these emissions do, in fact, harm human health. And the Supreme Court said, yes, this is the case. The EPA must regulate greenhouse gas emissions. So for over 10 years, or about 10 years now, we have had a law on the books which says that we need to be regulating greenhouse gas emissions. What this would do is create a de facto carbon tax. Industry would still be free to burn fossil fuels, but the, any emissions above a scientifically deemed safe threshold, which would be very low, would then be fined at uh, a per ton rate, and these fines would be quite expensive. And that would have the effect of introducing a carbon tax. Products made with fossil fuel energy would become more expensive. That would drive consumer demand towards clean energy, clean technology, that, in turn, would drive investment in the same direction. And all of that money that I was describing, corporate America sitting on now over $2 trillion worth of uninvested capital, would start flowing into building out large-scale renewable energy, uh, building out the renewable energy, uh, the uh, electric vehicle fleet, et cetera, et cetera. So we have all the components we need. We've got the technology, we've got the money, we even have the laws. And the thing we're missing is the political will, the political imagination, and some of that has to do with a deep cynicism around the question of climate change, and that is not entirely irrational because the, the science about it is so um, 
depressing. So for all these pieces to come together and for us to move forward around adaptation and mitigation, another thing that's going to happen, have to happen is we're going to have to recognize the centrality of government, the centrality of the state in moving forward and also in the actual history of how capitalism has developed all over the world, I would argue, but particularly in the U.S. There is a, a hidden developmentalist state that goes back to the earliest origins of the Republic. From the very beginning after the American Revolution, the government took an active role in nurturing manufacturing, building up industry by using tariffs, using subsidies. Unfortunately, war was often crucial in legitimizing the state's role in guiding and um, shaping industrial development. But what we have to do, in other words, in facing this new threat is return to traditional policy tools that are frequently ignored, often maligned, and unfortunately, as a result, forgotten and misunderstood. But what we have to do to deal with climate change is essentially reindustrialize our society, and we could do a lot worse than studying how we originally industrialized and use that in a broad sense as a blueprint for a green, clean tech reindustrialization.